on Zoom. And Saul, I think that you can you can start your presentation. Well, your your introduction. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good evening to everybody. My name is Saul Andretti, and I will act as chair today. Uh, so the first participant who will talk today is uh, uh, Professor Rami Gabriel. He's a PhD associate professor of psychology in the Department of Humanity, History, and Social Sciences. Uh, and fellow at School of Liberal Arts and Sciences Research Group in Mind, Science and Culture at Columbia College, Chicago. His paper is, uh, is entitled The Mythology of Psychology. Uh, Rami, please, 20 minutes. Thank you all very much. I'll just share my screen. Is everyone, can everyone see this? Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be at this um, conference on mythology. Um, as um, our host is saying, I am a professor of psychology. And what I'll be doing today is speaking a bit about uh, my new book, A Suspicious Science, The Uses of Psychology, which will be published by Oxford University in March. Um, some of the materials I'll be drawing from also come from an article for Aeon called Myth in the Mind, and an article for the New Humanist called Is Psychology the New Superstition? Um, so what I'll be doing, I'll start off talking about mythology and pragmatism. That is, I'll talk about what mythology does for us psychologically. Then I'll make some suggestions about how science and psychology can fulfill some of the functions of mythology in, uh, in our time. And then I'll end by suggesting that uh, we live in a, in a period that can be characterized as the mental episteme. That is um, uh, the period in which we use mental terms to speak about um, in sort of enchanted forces. Um, so I'd like to start off with something with the, probably our shared ground, which is what is mythology and what does it do? We know that mythology provides explanatory framework that includes causal predictive principles. Um, it's also known to um, include origin stories. Uh, all mythologies have an origin story uh, embedded in it. And mythology usually includes a discussion of soteriology, that is the, uh, the path to salvation. And sometimes it has some language that might discuss the therapeutic path to salvation, that is how to get to a better place, how to solve certain aches and pains. Uh, and finally, Mythology generally includes practices uh, or rituals um, that enact and entrain knowledge. That is, um, the mythology is embedded into social practices. So I think this is, this is a space that we all share, this understanding of mythology. And now what I'd like to do is, is move a little bit more into my argument. Um, the first important point I want to make is that mythology has a pragmatic function. That is to say, it offers an emotionally satisfying solution to the tragic facts of life, which are beyond our comprehension. And that's why I think we have the origin story in mythology, because it, it answers a, a fact of life that's generally beyond our comprehension. Um, I also think that's why metaphysics, uh, ontology, uh, who we are, what we are, as well as epistemology, how do we know, how can we come to know who we are and what we are, um, are included, as well as ethics. What ought we to do in our situation? Uh, so fulfilling all these functions makes it a pragmatic format <clears throat> for, uh, for uh, understanding our position in the world, our condition. Within a given society, uh, I argue that mythology serves as a collective epistemic niche, which structures belief and ritual. And what I mean by the term epistemic niche, it's an analog with the term in evolutionary biology of the ecological niche. Ecological niche is the, the ecology that we inhabit. So human beings adapted to an ecology, um, air, oxygen, water, rain, etc. And uh, there's a lot of discussion in psychology about how we have now built, we have buildings, we have 
um, electronics. We have all these machines that we've built into the environment and it's an environment, it's a niche. It's what they call an extended niche. We, we've created the world that we live in. It's not just the world that we're, we're born into a world that human beings created. And with this concept, epistemic niche or imaginary order, or, or the easiest way to say it, it's a cultural construction, I'm saying that we've also built a world of ideas, mythology for any given society. Um, there is a mythology which um, creates or structures the beliefs and rituals of the people. So I'm saying mythology serves as a collective epistemic niche. And we can see this a lot in the anthropological literature um, when there's discussions of um, how mythology serves to structure uh, social relations as well as philosophical beliefs. The, the further step I want to make is to argue that science itself consists of symbols, uh, consists of symbols that we use to explain reality. And of course, the scientific revolution is a few hundred years old, but what's interesting about it is that it does offer an epistemic niche which structures our beliefs and rituals. And two very obvious examples are the theory of evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution explains an origin story, namely the story of, um, uh, well, neo-Darwinism talks about genetics, etc., cetera, and, uh, and uh, adaptation. And something very basic about chemistry, chemistry offers us a set of tools and concepts to explain what objects are made of. Now, this is a, this is a thought that has, um, of course, uh, been said before, um, maybe a hundred years ago, is science the mythology of a secular society? And um, there's something very obvious about this question, but there's something uh, uh, that still still bothers us. You know, there's there's sort of a critical wave of humanists who say that yes, science is just another another religion. That's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying science is another epistemic niche, and um, I would like to um, use this idea to introduce that psychology itself, as a science has taken up some of this weight of structuring our beliefs and rituals. <clears throat> so I'll just go, to, uh, I, and when I say psychology, I, um, being a psychologist, I'd like to just describe here the range of, um, of activities and knowledge practices that, are, that have come to constitute psychology. There's the, uh, the behavioral sciences, which most people are familiar with, this includes the neurosciences, social psychology, developmental psychology, and cognitive psychology. These sometimes we call empirical psychology. Um, and this is because we're running experiments and those experiments are using the scientific method to deliver certain uh, inductive principles about the nature of the mind. What we are ending up with causal predictive principles. You've seen this probably in all kinds of things, including in behavioral economics. They use causal predictive principles from psychology. When we talk about raising children, and we use developmental psychology principles. The neurosciences are very important, especially neurology. We use it to understand um, breakdowns and uh, brain injuries and rehabilitation. So I'm arguing here that these are causal predictive principles. Clinical psychology, which many of you are familiar with, is, the, is therapy, is psychodynamics, Freudian psychodynamics, and then cognitive behavioral, etc. <clears throat> I would argue that clinical psychology is a type of soteriology. It's about salvation. It's, about, it's a type of therapy unto salvation. Popular psychology, which you may be familiar with, there are, there's a whole, there's a huge industry of self-help books, which are arguably more, more well-known than any of these other types of psychology. Popular psychology and self-help, if you look at them, are full of rituals and practices. Top five things to do. Top 10 ways to change your life. These are all rituals and practices. And finally, the pharma psychopharmaceutical industry, the drug industry, does offer something which is a bit like the magic potion. 
a way of fixing, changing things um, through, through a potion. Um, I'm not going to speak so much about drugs. I do have a chapter about this in the book, and it's a very interesting thing to talk about. And, and, uh, sort of in the book, I talk about agency through this, um, through this topic. But I just want to introduce, you, introduce these things to, to give you an idea of what I mean when I say psychology. I don't just mean Freud, and I don't just mean neuroscience. I mean all of these things are the uses uh, of this scientific, this uh, type of science of the mind. <clears throat> mythology allows us to articulate our beliefs. So I was talking about structuring, the, the structuring that mythology does. The symbols adopted in an epistemic niche reflect the local historical and cultural factors because, this is the words of Eliade, myth is the re retrospective transfiguration of sacrificial crises in the light of the cultural order that has arisen from them. So what I'm, I'd like to argue using Eliade's idea is that uh, conceptions of mind are an aspect of science and they serve as our epistemic niche. And I, I need now to um, clarify what I mean by the local historical and cultural factors. So one of them obviously is that we live in the age of science. Um, but I wanna say that psychology has taken on the aspect of science, which is human nature. Psychology is trying to explain the mind. They call, in psychology, they call this psychic unity. The idea that we're trying, when we try to explain the mind, we're trying to explain all minds, all human minds, if, if we do the science correctly, should be explained through this scientific method. So my claim here is that psychology serves as a mythological origin story of human nature. And if we interrogate it, we find that it art, articulates our commitment to two concepts, individualism and materialism. And I'd like to briefly describe these two. <clears throat> individualism. This is a, a notion, a post, uh, um, uh, post-enlightenment notion. Individualism posits that notions of agency, whereby the will is a determinant moral factor, um, are of utmost importance. And this is within the concept of the liberal consuming subject. Of course, I'm not going to talk too much about consumerism, but my first book is about this, is about uh, what does it mean to be a subject in, in, uh, in during modernity. Part of it has to do with consumption, desire being fulfilled through consumption. Um, but of course, this important notion of agency. What does it mean to be a self? Another important aspect of individualism is the notion of autobiographical aspects of the self which we commonly talk about as identity. Identity forms the basis of notions of agency and constitutes the core of significances that suffuse in an individual's actions in ethical contexts. Some uh, very well-known examples of individualism in psychology include the psychoanalytic model of the mind, Freud's, uh, um, Freud's uh, superego, ego it. Um, um, any therapeutic model usually centers on the individual. There are some social relational models, but mostly it's all individualist stuff. So uh, individualism is one of what I'm, what I'm calling here, one of the um, core commitments of psychology as a story of human nature. And the other one is materialism, which is at the core of, science, of uh, the scientific um, epistemic niche. And metaphysical materialism is of course the notion that there's only one substance in the universe and that substance is matter. Scientists from Newton on have discussed that if we are able to in fact explain um, the world just through natural, natural causes, natural objects, we will end up with a type of mechanical notion of the universe. Mechanical meaning we'll be able to explain the laws by which objects relate. And um, some of the best neuroscience is in fact pursuing a mechanical notion of the brain. Uh, the, best, the best example is, of course, psychopharmaceuticals. The drugs where you give, you give a drug, it changes a neurotransmitter, and then there's a change in the behavior of the individual. That is a sort of proof of concept of materialism. So my argument here so far is that um, psychology is a type of 
epistemic niche. It's a type of myth uh, about human nature. And if we look at it closely, we find that individualism and materialism are at the core of this myth. I will uh, briefly explain here um, the context within which, remember I, I was saying, or Eliade was saying that um, when, we, uh, when we create a mythology, it has to reflect the local historical and cultural factors. So what are these local uh, factors? Stuff that is very familiar to you, the crises of modernity, the, uh, the notion of determinism that came with science, the notion of mechanization that came with um, industrial, industrialization. And I'm, I put the word delocalization here uh, to, to signify the um, dispersal of people, the diasporic dispersals that we've seen in the last uh, 200, 200 years, but really escalating in the 20th century, being taken away from, from where you're from, living in other places. These are the, some of the crises of modernity that I think that these, this mythology of psychology is, is responding to. Uh, of course, what these have, crea have created or have been paired with is secularism and doubt. Um, there's also, of course, a great book by uh, Charles Taylor, A Secular Age, where he's trying to posit that we live in it. We, we're not really in a secular age. Um, but but we, one thing that's for sure is that we are in an age of doubt, an age of doubt about beliefs, an age of doubt about what's real, what's not real, an age of doubt about, about knowing ourselves, about self-knowledge. And I think this is why psychology is, uh, this is one of the reasons psychology is so Im important or it has such a prominent position in our knowledge uh, industry. Um, because psychology offers a set of symbols which are between science and superstition. They, they do some of the function of science and they do some of the function of superstition. The concept of the mind is a reflexive play of belief explanation and affectively charged knowledge practices. Beliefs about the mind loop into knowledge and narratives of personal agency. That is, these concepts are doing a lot of work for us. They're allowing us to, to be within our, our period of science and mechanization, but they're also allowing us to have some superstitions through these rituals, these pop psychology practices, the idea of the magic potion pill, notions of um, mental health, in, uh, in, in um, clinical psychology. And these are also looping into what we think we are. So it's, it's a reflexive play. It's a cultural construction and it allows us to have some sort of grasp upon uh, who we are, what we are. That's the language that psychology offers. Um, in our technologically advanced society, Psychology acts as a mythological system to ground our metaphysical beliefs in A, positivist visions of the brain, and B, the primacy of personhood of the individual agent and political subject. What the world has lost in becoming disenchanted, the mind has gained an epistemological status. We can only imagine the influence and causal power of enchanted processes to occur in the mind. Psychology thus reflects cultural and historical niche in which we exist. This is sort of my, my, my summary of, of what I'm trying to say um, in, this, in this paper. And I'm uh, very interested to hear what you think of this. Um, my, final, my final idea is this notion that we live in a mental episteme. That is, we explain behavior through mental processes and concepts. We've come to, to develop a language we call psychology through which we can explain behavior through mental terms. And I'll just wrap up quickly. The personal and societal crises caused by industrialism and cybernetics battered us towards a superstitious framework that allows for control over our minds through reflexive mental terms. Psychology is that system of discourse that allows for explanations that serve as adjunctive rituals to ennoble us with agency and reflexivity in the face of the existential crisis of determinism. Um, I won't have time to get into this, but in the book, I get into this notion of how do we create order? How do we um, project order into our epistemic niche? Um, so I'll just say the uses of psychology are the ways we enact our commitments to knowledge practices that provide solutions to the crises of modernity. And to summarize, uh, simultaneously in us and beyond us, 
mythology uh, is a pragmatic assemblage of symbols drawn from our local cultural context to satisfy the affective need for explanation. Our sense of awe towards the power of technology, scientific analysis, and individualism legitimates psychology as a mythology of mental terms. Finally, the uses of psychology are rituals that maintain the mythology of material, metaphysical materialism and political individualism. Here are some references that I used. I'm happy to um, send this presentation to anyone who's interested. And uh, I'll, I'll just thank you finally. And I am open the floor to questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for such an illuminating paper. Perfect timing, actually. Can you hear me? Great. Great. Yeah. Yes, I can. Thank you very much indeed. So we have 10 minutes for the questions. So let's open the dances. Who has questions for, for Rami, for Professor Gabriel? So, well, uh, uh, I invite you all to, to ask some questions as well. As uh, you know, you can uh, use your microphone. So, um, uh, Angela, also I invite you as well. And people on YouTube, I know there's some delay, but maybe if you write your questions, I will try my best to, to read it in, in the time we have. So, so Rami, uh, I have uh, um, under, understood that there is some, some relation to what you are saying um, uh, with, the, with the lack of order, the lack of meaning of postmodernism. And um, I'm not, uh, well, uh, my question is about how science and, and myth are used to, to give meaning to, to this, I don't know how to say it, uh, nihilistic voice or <laughs> reality. Well, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to argue is that science can function as myth. Obviously we've used science to explain, um, um, I mean, science is, has, is a lot of things. We can talk about evolution theory in terms of our origin story. We can talk about the way, you know, all kinds of bio, biotechnology, bioengineering. You know, of course, science is the way in which we, we control the world, really. It's the way in which we control nature. And um, postmodernism is so much about this a critique of uh, what we've ended up doing with our power. Uh, and then science also, or science or psychology as a science is trying to explain, you know, are we really evil? Are we um, just grabbing, grabbing, grabbing things and, and not, not considering <clears throat> the planet, et cetera. A lot of these climate things do redound to psychological e explanations about, about why, um, why we have, are acting the way we are towards the world. Now, mythology also has a function too. We have, of course, mythology that's being trumpeted now, mythology of end times, mythology of nuclear, etc. These are myths that, you know, the world ends, the world also ends. Uh, it's, it's part, it's in the, the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's in, uh, every tradition has some idea of the end. So mythology is also being used to explain our postmodern position of, of strife. Uh, you know, even the Tower of Babel, the great, the great story that we're you've just caused such a mess and there's no way it's gonna work out. So we're still using mythology to, 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 to even create these stories, create this epistemic niche of explaining what we're doing. And science, I've just suggested a couple of things that it's, that it's uh, being used for to uh, interpret our situation. So that's a little, a little bit of an answer for you. Any more questions? Can I just make some comments? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the for the paper. Uh, I have to say that for me it was very interesting. I do literary studies and I study the the, the use of myth or the presence of myth in uh, specifically in contemporary Irish theater. And I have to say that after listening to your paper, I am just considering how I can incorporate your ideas. The, this idea that psychology is. Uh, also uh, or can be understood as myth and according to what you have said I have understood that uh, some of the plays that I actually um, 
study or analyze from the perspective of how, for instance, the classical myths are reworked can also be analyzed from your perspective. So I wanted to ask you about that possibility, if you consider that psychology and literary studies and mythology and myth criticism can be uh, related in that in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, you're familiar with Bernard Williams' work on, on so the classical classical uh, theater is is easier to talk about, and I think that's one of the things that I took from Bernard Williams' work is the idea that the gods the gods play a role of um, of projecting order. Uh, like I, one of the one of the slides I had was about the Bhagavad Gita and how uh, um, you have this projection of order into the voice of Vishnu. Yes. But also in the in the Iliad. In the Iliad, know, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, yes. Right. You have this projecting Apollo does order, you know. Yes. Uh, uh, so th there is there is a lot, there's a lot of good stuff there. You see, that's and this is also in the in I think the Greek says in the irrational, the Dodds book, where he's saying they're not actually gods, they're just or uh, Simon Vile is also doing this. They're not actually gods, they're just the voices of psychology. Yes. And we call them gods, you know? So, Constructions of our minds, so as to say. Yeah, and we project it into, okay, a god is saying that, but it's really an emotion. That's also, the, the, there's also a literature about that. Um, so I think it's a very fruitful thing. I mean, that's one of the things I want, I'm, I'm moving towards. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm writing a, another book, but the book I'm, I'm planning on is about imaginary orders, about how we All create right. these, these epistemic niches. And I, I do want to talk about theater in fact, about Indian theater around oh, right. independence because of how they were uh, using these classical forms to, to project an order of these, this post, you know, post-revolution, post-independence. Very interesting. So I, I think that's a very fruitful space. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, anybody else questions? I actually want to read your book. That's just a comment. Yes, I really want too. to read your book. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, great. March 2023. Yeah, yeah. I, I took a note of that. <laughs> um, so, anybody else? Well, thank you all very much. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, we shall pass to the next speaker. So let's see if I can pronounce Spanish correctly. Uh, Maria del Mar González Chacón. Perfecto. Oh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, so Maria del Mar González Chacón uh, lectures at the University of Oviedo. Her main research is focused on contemporary Irish theatre, with a special interest in the theatre of Marina Carr and the rewritings of female classical myths. She also studies and published Irish versions and adaptations of Larkham. Today, she will uh, present a paper entitled Greek Tragedies in Irish Theatre, Unmasking the Myth to Demystify Contemporary Identities. Please. Thank you very much for the, for the presentation. And uh, thank you very much to the conference uh, organizers, especially thank you very much to Adrian, okay, who is always there to support and to update uh, mm -hmm. information for, for all of us. So my intention today is to, to offer a brief discussion on the meaning of uh, myth in a very specific uh, context, which is uh, contemporary Irish theatre, uh, my field of study. And in order to do this, I will start by, um, oh, sorry, should I share my screen? Yes, because I have a PowerPoint. Yes. Can you confirm that you can see these guys? Yes, thank you very much, Adrian. Okay, all right. So as I was saying, I will start by recapping some discussions about the concept of, of myth, um, about uh, the debates uh, and its use in contemporary society, uh, both by Irish scholars and other uh, scholars. And I will try to offer some conclusions which will include some examples of plays um, which are writings of classical myths to illustrate my position as regards uh, a possible definition of myth always within this field of study. So I will start uh, by uh, 
saying that the scholars have discussed the, the meaning of myth widely. If we depart from Burke, it is interesting to uh, recap his idea that we need to consider what the myth is doing and saying to take into account uh, its original uh, role, for instance, in the Greek tragedies where myth, uh, as the previous lecture has also said, uh, were stories to exemplify. After this, we have, uh, for instance, Don Cupid, uh, who through his family resemblance approach offered uh, a definition of the concept of myth that allowed to establish whether a narrative is mythic uh, or not. And it is relevant here to evoke uh, some of the keywords that uh, he used for this. And I quote, so we may say that a myth is typically a traditional sacred story of anonymous authorship and archetypal or universal significance, which is recounted in a certain community and is often linked with a ritual. Cupid coincides then with Burke when he highlights that the work of myth is to explain, uh, to reconcile, to guide action or to legitimate. And then in the 1990s, we have the philosopher Paul Ricoeur, uh, who stated that we need to go beyond the definition of myth as a false explanation or narration to grasp its significance as a tool to explore and contribute to understanding. And thus, we will uh, comprehend the symbolic function of myth and, of course, its power to reveal. For recur, myth implies, and I quote, a disclosure of unprecedented worlds, an opening on to other possible worlds which transcend the established limits of our actual world. In other words, uh, through myths, we are revealed new realities and sometimes dissenting realities, as I will argue. Uh, later. Considering now that myths travel in time and thus they are involved in this constant process of transformation, we can also state that in those processes to reveal or to exemplify the context of recreation of the myths play of course an important role. And this was already signaled by Lawrence Coupe in myth, uh, where he draws, for instance, to the Egyptian myth of Osiris and her envious brother Set to present it as the paradigm of fertility myth. Uh, we all know the story of uh, how Set, after being killed by Set, sorry, the goddess uh, Isis, recovers all the uh, scattered parts of his body and makes Osiris father to a child, Horus. And thus, this fertility myth was uh, afterwards used on ceremonies by the reigning kings who used Horus as the representation of the new king and Osiris as the representation of the deceased. And more modern stories, for instance, literary creation, can also create these paradigms. This is the case of the characters of The Tempest by Shakespeare, Prospero, Miranda, Ariel, who will be examples of or paradigms of literary myth. And this identification between myth and the literary text is what makes Coupe state that, and I quote, cultural and literary criticism may involve mythography or the interpretation of myth, given that the mythic is an important dimension of the cultural and literary experience, as can be seen in the Irish recreation of Greek myths in the hands of Irish playwrights. For Coupe, while myth can be paradigmatic and while it may imply a social and cosmic order or perfection, it also carries with it a promise of another mode of existence entirely, to be realized just beyond the present time and place. So it is not only foundational, but also liberating. And that is why dissenting voices can or have found very often their uh, space in myths. And of course, uh, to conclude this revision, we need to mention the work or the works of Losada, for whom, and I'm going to translate him here, the myth is not a mental construct and connected to social cultural vicissitudes. It has engraved in its skin and guts the trace of each individual and society. The myth for Losada is a slave excited to achieve freedom, so involved in this constant process of transformation. 
That is to say, the myth reaches and creates new spaces for transformation, and thus, myth criticism for Losada must be interdisciplinary, and the methodology in the field must address this, and it is urgent for him, and I quote, a bigger relationship between human knowledge that shared with myth criticism, the fields of study, the methods, the objectives, and the associated results. So a new myth criticism is necessary to address the creation of new myths and also the rewriting, of course, of the classical ones. So how does all this uh, or how do all these ideas relocate in the context of contemporary Ireland, contemporary Irish theatre and literary studies? In literary studies in, in Ireland, latest publications about the use of myth uh, reveal two tendencies. On the one hand, we have studies related to the use or revival of the Celtic myth and those related to the rewriting of the Greek myths. As regards Celtic myths, articles and books have been published about the role of the Celtic myth in the construction of European identities to escape the English influence and the consequences of colonialism, which included, of course, processes of acculturation in Ireland. There are also analyses on the role of myth in children's fast fantasy to foster creativity and imagination, so in a way to create those uh, other possible worlds that we mentioned before, also on uh, educational, um, educational contexts. Other studies address, as Losada has suggested, the relationship between myth and globalization, which can be related to Ireland's integration in Europe, as well as its openness to new cultures and identities after the diasporas of the past. And we continue having these compilations or retellings of well-known Irish myths, such as the myth of Lida and the Swan, but now maybe from a feminist perspective, so relevant in Ireland where uh, the situation of women uh, continues being a debatable issue, or the presence of the Ku Klain myth in the poetry of W.B. Yeats to reclaim the richness of the Irish culture with its own sacred stories and with its own heroes and heroines. And as regards the second tendency that I mentioned, the presence of Greek myths in Irish literature, specifically within the field of Irish contemporary theatre, the focus has been on the rewritings of feminine classical myths, such as Medea, Iphigenia, Phaedra by Marina Carr, or the myth of Penelope by Enda Walsh or Frank McGuinness' Hecuba, to mention a few. And essential studies uh, to consider in this sense are, for instance, those of Melissa Sira, Claire Wallace, Maria MacDonald, for whom the unmasking of feminine classical myths constitutes a strategy used by contemporary writers to readdress the role of women in Irish society. And by unmasking the Greek female myths, they are also deconstructing the Irish female myths, such as, for instance, the myth of Mother Ireland, uh, related to this um, creation of the stereotypical roles of uh, Irish women as guardians of the community and thus deprived of uh, individuality and agency. So comparative analysis between the classical myths and the modern versions allow to identify and interpret the spaces of transformation and thus to consider the myths as sites of resistance. I myself have done these in some articles, such as the one that you can uh, see uh, in the slide, where I compare, for instance, the classical myth of Hecuba with the versions by Frank McGuinness or Marina Carr, uh, to conclude that each of them, each of the rewritings, was uh, clearly affected by its uh, recreation context, and, and that was the, the myth. And apart from Sira, uh, Wallace, and MacDonald, we need also to consider some relevant volumes specifically devoted to, in Ireland, to the rewritings of Greek myths by contemporary writers. Uh, these have been published during the last decades, and here we must uh, mention Michael Walton, Marianne MacDonald again, Brian Arkins, Lisa Fitzpatrick, and Shona Hill. And all of them have addressed the concept of myth in Irish theatre. Starting with Walton, for him, the power of myth is that it becomes personal by virtue of its universality, and it invites decodings tied to each new occasion or circumstance. So myth can reveal you to yourself, 
And as Irish writers have turned to ancient Greek materials as translators or adaptators, or what you will sow in the process through myth, they have tended to unmask themselves in the repetition of this process of unmasking the myth and unmasking the writer or the playwright in this case. So there is this double process of uh, unmasking the myth and unmasking the writer related to the also to the Irish condition as a post-colonial country who is still uh, involved in this deep process of redefinition of identity. And thus the spaces of transformation that playwrights create when they readdress the myths relate uh, directly to the changes in society they suggest. And the classical myths are rewritten accordingly, according to these social changes. Walton discusses precisely this, uh, how the Greek myths should be redefined or adapted for the modern audience. And he also highlights the appealing of the Greek myths to those who want to take advantage of the distancing that a classical setting may offer, making reference here to some moments in Irish history where repression is still needed or still needs the masks. And Walton identifies this relationship between the myth and the new settings. For instance, a Prometheus from Tom Polly's uh, Sees the Fire can be read as the representation of Ireland, the rebel controlled by Zeus or England. The revenge theme of the Oresteia can be read, for instance, in Marina Carr's Ariel, where a criticism to Irish uh, corrupt politicians can also be discerned. And it is these feelings for resonance and for metaphor where the power of myth uh, resides for Welton and why Greek myth has proved so uh, fruitful in Ireland. Going back to Marianne MacDonald, uh, she argues that in many ways, Ireland was and is contracts, sorry, constructing its identity through the representations offered by Greek tragedy and Greek myths. And she makes reference to the Irish Hedge schools as one of the first acquaintances with the classics and an obvious attempt to claim a, a culture of their own by the Irish people, and how the Irish had to use this literature in the 20th century also to feed their own subversive protests to fight the British attempts of acculturation, obviously. The Irish could conceal the direct statement of their desires, again, behind the mask of Greek tragedy and Greek myths. So MacDonald coincides here with Walton, and moreover, she outlines Euripides as one uh, of the most popular uh, playwrights uh, in Ireland. Euripides' herrings, for instance, are very often revisited by Irish uh, playwrights, as we will suggest at the end of this paper. And then we have Lisa Fitzpatrick, who recovers this unifying meaning of myth when she argues that one of the aspects that defines Irish literature, Irish theatre at the beginning of the 21st century is this search for a binding mythology with which to express and unify conceptions of Irish identity for the contemporary stage. She also establishes this relationship between myth and society, where she defines the Irish society as a space where these reworkings of the myths are exposed to depict a society in this array, a society marked by globalization, the integration in Europe, and where the concept of post-national needs to be used to understand that people have lost commonalities. And she adds to the idea of acculturation, the concept of linguistic acculturation to explain how the translations of the classical uh, Greek myths become in the hands of Irish writers, adaptations and versions enriched with cultural references uh, from the context of reproduction. Brian Arkins identifies similarities in the use of myth by the classical tragedies and contemporary Irish playwrights. In both cases, there is again this distancing technique used to comment on uh, utterly dramatic events, what he uh, names as to speak the unspeakable. And additionally, he rewrites the ideas of the spaces for transformation, and he uses the concept of the myth's flexibility, which allows the dramatists to include uh, the innovations. And to conclude, this part, latest publications of the meaning of myth in Irish theatre confirm its uh, relevance in the literature of the nation as a mirror up to it. For Shona Hill, uh, a nation's heritage is one of its unifying components, offering a sense of the past and future through a created collective consciousness of its people. So mythologies are part of this heritage and traditional 
uh, stories passed down through the ages, which serve to explain the world and its orders to society. She recalls Richard Kearney, one of the best known Irish scholars, his idea that myth is closely related to tradition as a rewriting of the past, and that this rewriting always implies, however, that some experiences are included and some others excluded, and with excluded, sorry, and within this context, Hill highlights the importance of dismantling the mechanics of myths. Uh, as a central structure of the nation's storytelling, arguing that myth can also be repressive when it represents the dominant ideology. So to conclude uh, my um, uh, paper, I would like to say that Irish playwrights unmask themselves by unmasking the Greek myths. They use the distant settings to evoke current social events and to construct identities. Myth continues being a binding tool which works in globalized island to recover the lost commonalities. And in this sense, myths can be said to be global, flexible and unifying, but also subversive when they represent the dissenting voices or criticize the dominant ideology or repressive when they perpetuate roles that do not work anymore in contemporary society. So myths are sites of resistance, as I often conclude after my comparative analysis, and are involved in processes of linguistic acculturation, for instance, which reveal the mythical status of the studied stories. And this can be exemplified in Irish literature, in Irish contemporary theatre, through the works of Marina Carr, for instance, in her play By the Book of Cats, a myth legitimizes women's difference. And her Irish media, for instance, justifies uh, her acts of violence through the representation of the oppression suffered. Or in her play, Phaedra Backwards, where Phaedra resists and demands her right to explain her story backwards through its uh, overarching themes, which are women's agency and um, their search for identity in contemporary Irish society. We also have the play of Penelope by Ender Walsh, where the concept of waiting is used to represent the hold of Ireland after the post-Celtic tiger crisis. Myth in Ireland preserves the ability to transcend the limits of the real world and brings the possibility of other worlds outside the constraints of the former. And this is extending to the new concerns of the contemporary society. For instance, the myth of Icarus is rewritten by Shane McAmbert to express the um, effects of the Anthropocene in his play Melt where we have two Irish scientists in the Antarctica as the protagonists of a play that represents new Irish theatre related to uh, social activism, a play that speaks to its moment through myths. Myth in Ireland also question its own essence in relation to literature itself, for instance, in the play Breezes After the Black by Dylan Coburn Gray, which is a representation about the meaning of myth and why we tell them an adaptation of an adaptation of the myth of Brizzy and Achilles, where the myth is rewritten, the roles are reversed, the original myth is criticized. The fact, for instance, that Brizzy just disappears and doesn't even get to die in the original myth. And the role of the playwright when approaching the myth explained as an intention to explode the myth. And the mythological characters, Brizzy is openly stating that, and I quote, I don't want to be a myth because myths are simple stories for a cruel world. Since, according to uh, the playwright, Brises still hasn't found what he's looking for, and neither have myths, because as Losada said, uh, they continue being slaves, uh, striving to uh, achieve freedom. Thank you very much. Okay, I think 20 minutes. Yes, very good. Thank you very much for your paper. Can you all hear me? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we have 10 minutes for the questions. Thank you very much indeed for your paper about the writing of myth. It was extremely interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. So any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Okay, then maybe I will ask you some some uh, well, uh, the mathematician. 
<laughs> Sorry? You are the icebreaker, yes? Yeah. <laughs> Always. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if you are saying that myth is political, as in inherently political, or that it can be used for a political end, let's say. If you can tell us more about that. Okay. Um, I don't think it's political, but I think it is used, as you said, and the second uh, option, okay, that you mentioned for uh, contesting uh, political uh, issues, political uh, debates, okay? Mm -hmm. When you ask, for instance, the playwrights themselves, uh, they say that they are not interested in using the myth in that way, but they are interested in the rewriting process which uh, involves that they can uh, give a voice to those who are oppressed, for instance, women in Ireland, the situation of women in Ireland through the rewriting of um, feminine uh, classical myths, for instance. Yeah, I, 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 yes, I think the, yes. the, there was a conference before, I, I'm, I am, I'm not sure about the year, but it was about myth and, and subversion. Okay, and, and that was uh, one of the one of the topics I think that nowadays uh, myth are sub subverted because of some something or to say something specific about, yes. you know, for example, or the re reappropriation of the myth of Med Medusa, for example, for instance, a feminist symbol or icon. In Ireland, for instance, it's very interesting how they use classical myths. Uh, the, the last uh, article that I um, wrote about this was an, an article about um, the myth of Iphigenia in Ireland. The, the myth from the uh, perspective of how different playwrights rewrite this idea of women and sacrifice which is related obviously with the myth of Iphigenia, but also with the situation of women in Ireland. If you read the Constitution of Ireland of 1936, it clearly states yeah. that women are expected to be indoors at home and take care of their family and sacrifice for the community. So it is very interesting to, to, to see how, yeah. how myths are used to rewrite and redefine many different uh, aspects. Also, as I mentioned, uh, corruption of politicians, okay? Also using classical myths. And many other issues, the, the, the story of Phaedra in order to uh, claim the rights of women to rewrite their own stories rather than being ignored, okay, through, through history. And then we have very interesting plays, for instance, uh, Melt, which is a, a rewriting of the myth of Icarus, but related to the Anthropocene and the importance of uh, ecological concerns nowadays in our society. And it is, it is very interesting to, to, to analyze myth, as, as you said, from a transgressive perspective, or as I said, as a site of resistance or as a space for dissenting voices, how they find in myth uh, a space to create all these spaces for transformation. Yeah, like yeah. myth as a tool um, yes. we use for different things. Okay, so uh, we do have uh, one question from Rami Gabriel, who is uh, excusing because he, he has to leave yeah. to, for a class. He must run to teach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank so, you very much, Rami, for your paper. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Very interesting. Ma I... Maybe R Rami, I I'm not sure. If, well, he's still here, but I I'm not sure if he's already teaching because I'm going to read his question. So maybe, yeah, so, you, you, you can read it yourself, Rami, before you go. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, okay. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I'm sorry about having to leave. It's a very interesting paper. Well, my, my question is, how does work like that of Dylan Colburn Gray work toward creating new contexts of myth which transform how we are seen in the future? Can they define us even if they do not catch on in the same way that classical myths have caught on? That is, these new myths of Irish theater, works of Yeats, for example, in that early period, how much they catch on and how can they help us characterize that period? 
Uh, I have to say that I had the opportunity to interview the the, the writer here, and when I uh, told him my reading of his play as a uh, retelling of the Eker's myth, he said that um, for him it was very important to um, reuse uh, mythology, Greek myths, in the context of contemporary Ireland because of this um, process of um, acculturation that they have suffered as a society from British uh, empire, so as to say, and how in the translations that they uh, had had access from the rewritings or from the translations of the classical myths, they could not see um, any Irish part. And as for your question, how they uh, catch on uh, those myths, I think they, they clearly see them as uh, tools to make the society reconsider really serious concerns for an island which is still involved in this constant process of redefinition of identity. And for him, he also mentioned that the myth of the um, Icarus represented the ambition of um, some Irish politicians, again, who had been very uh, or had acted in a very uh, greedy way in Irish society. Mm -hmm. So it was a way to try to establish connections between the classical world and contemporary world, but also a way to try to write their own stories or their own versions of those uh, rewritings. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Can and you all hear me? Jades, of course, Jades is, is, is involved okay. very much. Hear you. Jades is, is um, Jades and Lady Gregory and uh, were involved also in this process of uh, rewriting or recuperating the, 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 the myths. First of all, the Celtic myths, okay, but also uh, the Greek myths. Uh, to claim that they had uh, a culture of their own after being colonized, obviously. Sorry, I had thought you had finished talking. Right. My apologies. Yeah, sorry <laughs> about that. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, is anybody else going to ask a question? Okay, so I guess we shall um, read the unreadable name here. <laughs> I mean, the next participant, Ooh. whose name I will struggle to pronounce. I'll do my very best. Um, so we have uh, Paula Kimaresh. Is that correct? Yes, Kimaresh? that's right. Thank you. Uh, she is an associate professor of English literature, previously course director of European Languages and Literatures, Erasmus Program Coordinator and Research Group Coordinator, Intercultural Poetics, with above 60 works published on romantic of Italian authors, poetry and politics and women's writing. She will um, give a paper today entitled A Process of Mythical Transformation, Becoming Che, or Finding a New Critical Theory for a Reality that Surpasses Fiction. Please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, Saul, <laughs> I'm, I'm sharing um, just a slide, you know, um, let me see here, okay, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, the purpose of my paper is to contribute to a better understanding of contemporary processes of myth construction having to do with the real, including contemporary history and politics. I propose to do so today through an analysis of several theories and the discussion of the mythical elements in the life and posthumous legacy of Ernesto Che Guevara. To explain my choice, I quote a Portuguese poet, Manuel Alegre, in 1997. 
I know it is not politically and poetically correct to publish a book called Chair These Days, but maybe that's why I, I wrote and published it, because that's Chair's lesson, uh, because his life is also a form of poetry." End quote. For elect, and as for me, quote, Che Guevara is not just a myth, not even just a political project. It is, above all, a moral, effective, and magical reference, end quote. When dealing with mythical figures such as this one, pictorial ubiquity tends to create the impression that we know the subject we are talking about. That could be misleading, since part of the myth-making process usually involves reducing the contextual, political, and historical meanings. And with that, obviously, the man before the myth, Ernesto Guevara de la Serna. A guerrilla leader and theoretician, Cuba's international emissary for many years, the mind behind the economy, economic planning in Cuba, it is easy to understand why he became famous once one takes the trouble of learning about his real history. But what is so compelling is that more than 50 years since his death, not just his image, but his message is omnipresent and people still react passionately to it. Though I am a mere literature specialist uh, and not a theorist, the assumptions governing my approach is that myths, especially the most powerful, have a direct correlation with and impact on our real world, that, <clears throat> including the course of history itself. And though the meaning of myth has recently been equated with that with which is illusory or even untrue, as for example, urban myths, it frequently conveys a kind of deep truth or significance, one that is often beyond science or reason. To be controversial is thus in the very nature of both the concept, myth, and the person under analysis, Che. Throughout the years, myth has been conceived, theorized, and appropriated, used in different ways. In fact, all these classic theories could, even if just partially, help to explain the enduring power of Che's mythical and transformative dimension. So this is uh, <laughs> the exercise I will be doing. In the sense of Ernst Kesserer, Che Guevara's political myth or Guevarist ideology is indeed a form of thought combining the real and the ideal in which he responded to and created our and his new world or man. The wondrous myth-making imagination of his followers and detractors trying to overcome his many contradictions has attempted to circumscribe them to a logical model in Levi Strauss's sense as the structure of a romantic hero or anti-hero's narrative. Psychoanalytic critics in the line of Jung have seen Che as primordial image or archetype that is part of our collective unconscious, the type of the Oedipal rebel perpetually at war with an authoritarian patriarchal figure. As Che's narrative is very much a quest or set of quests, firstly for self-identity and afterwards for a Pan-American identity, we may interpret it as being the central myth or mono-myth in Northwood Fry's term of his tragic life. Finally, René Girard, for whom all myths are founded upon violence, may help us understand the dimension of ritualistic doctrinaire sacrifice, chess summary execution, to a form of communal violence represented by imperialism in the posthumous mythical religious appropriation of both his narrative and his image. Indeed, ideological approaches to myth tend to focus on the modern world and to include non-narrative material such as photographs. 
Originally, Marx's ideological conception of myth as widely propagated lie contrasted with Georges Sorel's positive view of myth as a group of mental images able to evoke an emotional response of such power as to inspire revolution. Myth has also been identified as the narrative of ideology. But then the proper task of the mythologist is to unmask its message. For Roland Barthes and his followers, myth belongs to a semiological system that serves to naturalize and universalize bourgeois culture. In this increasingly complex critical context, one might expect the overall tendency to be the one of the mythification of Cher's life and legacy. But that has not really been the case, in spite of an increasing knowledge of who Cher the man was. Like his philosophical mentor, Marx, Che Guevara did not believe in the idea of myth as such, or in any particular myth. His political tendency was to completely demystify reality. On the other hand, he might well have shared Sorel's idea of myth as a guiding ideology, one that advocates a fight to the death with the ruling class. Notwithstanding, Ernesto Guevara was certainly familiar with many mythical elements as he had been an avid reader of novels and of poetry in his youth. Besides being an inveterate literature lover and prolific writer, Che was also very aware of the poetry man lived by. Furthermore, he had a personal interest in collective myths connected with Latin American independence heroes and freedom fighters who frequently functioned as inspiring models or examples for his own struggle. As political myth is concerned, it refers to an ideological narrative that is believed and often followed by a particular social group. In 2001, Christopher Flood described a political myth as, quote, an ideologically marked narrative which purports to give a true account of a set of past, present, or predicted political events and which is accepted as valid in its essentials by a social group, end quote. Thinking specifically of Che Guevara's case, I adopt T.L. Thorson's observation that, um, quote, it is the mark of a modern myth to be able to explicitly create a <clears throat> a myth as a way of influencing others, as for example, Plato does in the Republic. And as Fidel Castro was well aware, especially after the tragic death of Guevara, the narrative of the Cuban revolution must be cast in dramatic form based on a past critical event. And it must serve a practical argument accepted as true or an ideology in order to be recast as a transformative national and international myth, a narrative which can in turn perpetually feed or sustain that argument. As every single myth has its protagonist or heroic figure that represents a particular community destined to create a morally coherent world which orients the community's activities towards its end, so does the Cuban myth have his heroic chair to represent and guide Fidel's community on the path to create that morally coherent socialist world towards a future new man. Because this process is both a foundation myth of new or renovated origins and a utopian vision only to be completely fulfilled in the future, it strongly suggests a mythopoeic construction, one in the light of which a more challenging and difficult present can be understood and endured. In her works on the philosophy of political myths, Chiara Botticci argues not only for the political role played by myths and the increasing interest in the symbolic 
and mythical dimension of politics, but also that myths are an important component of politics, even in contemporary modern society. She points out that political myths are not theories about the constitution of the world, and they do not aim to describe it, but rather to create their own world. In particular, she looks at political myth as a process of elaboration of a common narrative that provides significance to the political conditions and actions of a social group. This feature points to the fact that the same political myth can have very different meanings according to the particular circumstances in which it operates. What is a political myth for a certain group may well not be so for another, and the same narrative can work as a political myth in certain circumstances, but not in others. Religion, in contrast, does not allow the plurality of stories to simply coexist. It is implicit in the concept of faith that one believes in the particular story that is said to be sacred precisely because of its character as revealed truth. It is because in order to be a myth, it has to provide significance within changing circumstances that it is best understood as a process, as a work on myth in Blumenberg's term. Thus, Botici concludes that the three elements that are central to the concept are process, narrative, and significance. As such, political myths can both be the result of an already existing identity and the means to create an identity yet to come. In order to establish whether a narrative is a political myth or not, Botici argues we must look at the whole cycle of myth production, reception, and reproduction that constitutes it. The second consequence is that political myths are apprehended both consciously and unconsciously through a cumulative exposure to them. For Botici, this also explains their capacity to condensate into a few images or icons. Botici also notes that political myths can be the terrain of a radical imagination that advances a critique of the existing social order by disclosing alternatives to it. She says that we must judge whether the work on political myth opens or closes the, po the possibility of interrogating the social order. Though the narrative form unites political myth and utopias and both have the capacity to serve as guiding ideals, utopias are abstract models of societies that are no places. They can also be the result of the work of a radical imagination, but without the general expression of a determination to act or the capacity to put a collective drama on stage. Indeed, political myths are invitations to act here and now. The determination to act here and now, in spite of all the odds, was the distinguishing mark of Ernesto Che Guevara and of his own radical imagination, which in turn fed the Cuban collective drama. Uh, until today, of course. In October 1997, Castro addressed a crowd of thousands with these words, quote, why did they think that by killing him, you would cease to exist as a fighter? Today he is in every place, wherever there is a just cause to defend. His unerasable mark is now in history, and his luminous gaze of a prophet has become a symbol for all the poor of this world, end quote. Yet he knew that Che's political myth had started long before. In May 1968, less than a year after Shea's death in the Bolivian jungle, a Time magazine already exhibited Shea's myth in one of its titles, examining the rise of the phenomenon and the dedicated culture surrounding it, that he had captivated students, workers, radicals, and intellectuals all around the world. Indeed, his early international influence in the 1960s and 70s already assumed mythical proportions, leading to a wave of revolutions, rebellions, and reforms all around the world. 
in, in no small part because of his precocious death and martyrdom. In great part responsible for this afterlife is the snapshot that the photographer Alberto Corda took of the young revolutionary gazing determinedly into the distance at the state funeral. This photo taken in March 1960 went on to change the world. As author Michael Casey declared, wherever young people rise up, Corda's chair is there, crossing religious, ethnic, and even political divides. That this icon continued transforming the world long after those events was patent during, for example, the Iranian Revolution of 1979 in whole Latin America and also during the Arab Spring of 1112. Che epitomized not only the desire for change, but the will to act and has thus endured as a symbol for political and social revolution for several decades. The cultural transformation of the photo seems to reflect his own progress as he experiences a fragmented continent and the oppression of its different peoples, he undergoes an internal transformation. He would recall later that wandering around our America with capital A radically transformed him. I am not the person I was, he recorded after the journey. The film of Walter Saab's The Motorcycle Diaries of 2004 focuses precisely on the rite of passage from the middle-class Argentine doctor to the politically engaged leader as he witnesses exploitation and oppression in the heart of Latin America. He is gradually educated in that brutal reality, not, not only witnessing, but also sharing their poverty feeling a growing empathy for all the oppressed and exploited he needs. But when he discovers how fractured the real continent is and how dire the life of its inhabitants, his empathy is aroused and his passion is stirred towards a new focus, angry rebellion. In other words, the misery that he witnessed that is understood as the result of exploitation of the many by the few is of course unfair and produces a moral dilemma to look the other way or to resist. Obviously, Ernesto chooses the latter. Such association between moral values and rebellion is a clear similarity to Achilles Prometheus. Both could have just acknowledged the existing ruling powers Zeus and capitalism, respectively. And in doing so, they would have avoided not only the troubles of fighting oppression, but also their own punishments. But could they have simply ignored the suffering of the oppressed? Perhaps not, especially under a romantic gaze. In fact, since they are both young characters and high-minded, um, they uh, <clears throat> are passionate and inclined to pity. This obviously suggests a romantic, heroic construction of Che's character. Um, the distinction between ordinary and superior characters has been expressed by the concepts of high and low mimetic. According to Fry, the first corresponds to Aristotle's idea of superior character, that is, one superior to other humans, but still subject to moral judgment and to the power of nature. And as he commits a mistake, a series of events is set in motion in a way that will eventually cause his downfall. Such a mistake is called amarsia and traditionally corresponds to an action uh, <clears throat> carried out consciously or with only partial understanding. However, it can also be understood as a vulnerable position. And it is, in fact, in the African Congo that Che, as a tragic hero, begins to grasp the extent of his fall. Eventually, um, he leaves a Congo you know, on a new expedition now to Bolivia. But once there, um, the defeat is imminent. 
He is trapped and summar summarily executed. After his mistake, the reversal of the action and the discovery of peripathia comes the moment of pathos, suffering or death. According one minute, to, please. Yes, Sorry, one yes. minute maximum, please. Yes. Um, uh, and according to Fry, pathos is obviously the theme of tragedy. Martyrdom is indeed another mythic possibility not mentioned so far. The depiction of Che as a saint, martyr, or messiah. For example, San Ernesto de la Higuera is actually praised by the inhabitants of the village, of that village in Bolivia, where he was killed in 1967. Here, critics commit the mistake of focusing on the apparent contradiction between Guevara's notorious atheism and his contemporary worship as a saint. They do not consider that the very concept of myth involves a divine element corresponding to the realm of high mimesis. Besides the saint, Guevara has also been depicted as Christ and martyr. For example, the poet, Ruchero Balcazar, calls Guevara Cristo de America in her poem, Cristo Guerrillero. Though the symbolic mean of Christ's passion has been pointed out, it is the real Jesus Nazareth was a zealous Galilean peasant and Jewish nationalist who launched a foolhardy rebellion against the corrupt temple priesthood and the vicious Roman occupation. In other words, this Jesus um, is inserted in the context in which religion and politics are not separate. Indeed, it was a path of revolution against established powers. Moreover, this idea of zeal is relevant in terms of the characterization of Che as idealist, determined when not fanatically ascetic, refusing all sorts of privileges. The conscious decision by the martyr to sacrifice those privileges and oneself is an act of non-compliance in which he gains power over those who have sentenced him to death. I'm so very sorry, Paula, but time is up. <laughs> Yes, and uh, my, my, my ideas are also, <laughs> although I haven't finished. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's uh, enough. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Paula. I'm mm -hmm. sorry about rushing you, mm -hmm. but it would be nice to leave some, some time for the questions, uh, which is seven minutes for the questions should be enough. So anybody has questions, please go ahead. Yeah, maybe you can tell us a bit more about the, let's say, the, the process of myth, mythification or the, when we go from the, the physical reality of Che Guevara to the, I'm not sure if, if myth or symbol or the, the idea of the, of the person, of, of, the, of the fiction, maybe, I'm not sure. Um. <clears throat> Yes, um, uh, was that a question? <laughs> I was busy trying to remove the, uh, the, the slide. Okay, uh, so if you could uh, repeat it, thank you. Yeah, sorry. so the, um, I'm, I was asking or, or, or wondering maybe about the, the process of, yes. of well, Myth becoming so Myth or be yes. yes. Of the, becoming, becoming the, the symbol of the of the symbol. Myth. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so you are asking me uh, uh, in ge a general question. Uh, uh, yeah. If, 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 yeah if... Yes. So as you can, as you could see in the in the image, I tried to you know very briefly to sort of represent eventually this transformation. Okay, because it really uh, has you know different moments. In fact. Okay, so uh, from uh, an anonymous, an anonymous, you know, young man, you know, in Argentina, uh, who decides that he needs to get to know his continent, you know, South America, and then, uh, you know, progressively, you know, realizes that um, he needs to uh, understand and eventually intervene in this uh, harsh reality uh, that the different countries were facing, you know, and in particular, you know, the population, you know, the poor population, indigenous population, etc. 
And so we see the, that there is a fast moment of transformation, realization and transformation. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, you know, we have this development, which is a more political one. So if the first is a more social kind of awareness that he acquires, you know, as a, as a young man, then we have the political um, awareness that will transform, you know, this young man um, uh, into really, um, I would say, a tool of destruction of, you know, imperialism, of colonialism. Um, but there is an, a further transformation, you know, which I tried to show with the last image here, uh, not just the famous poster, you know, which is, of course, it has been subject to several, you know, cultural, you know, uh, theories uh, that I have also, you know, um, researched, uh, although, of course, I could, uh, I had no time to speak about that, it would be very interesting. Uh, so, uh, you know, what happened to the image of Che was also a process of transformation, you know, it became sort of independent, you know, from, from the, the real historical figure, so it's a very interesting analysis as well to be made. But, uh, you know, in terms of the man, you know, um, of course, there is this mm -hmm. irony, you know, that critics, you know, in fact, refer that uh, for mm -hmm. someone who was an atheist, you know, to suddenly become, you know, after his death, you know, uh, and in, in the place where he was killed, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even, um, he suddenly becomes this, you know, uh, saint-like mm -hmm. figure, okay, so... Uh, this revered, you know, uh, uh, sort of um, image, you know, uh, which raises, you know, a series of, you know, different questions, you know. Uh, so the person, in fact, uh, may not have to do, the real person may not have to do anything with uh, all of that. But the reality of the myth goes much <laughs> further, you know. So it really uh, uh, surpasses, you know, as I say in my title, you know, uh, fiction. Okay, so that's uh, basically my. Yeah, idea. I, I think the, the uh, really a problem, if you call it that way, with making someone or, or something a symbol mm -hmm. and that it can mm -hmm. be taken um, or uh, understood without its context. Like, for example, when we see the, the capitalist appropri appropriation of the image of the chair, like to, to print t shirts. Uh, and I, right. I think it's yes. so interesting in, in your in your slide that you went beyond mm -hmm. that. So. Uh, yes, so I was trying to find precisely different moments of transformation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the character, you know, that he was. But obviously, you know, um, the the image, uh, you know, really uh, goes, you know, through a series of different appropriations that, you know, mm. uh, are almost, you know, infinite, you know, uh, in our modern, you know, culture. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you very much well, indeed. This was great. So right on time, a seven, we made it. <laughs> uh, so I'm very proud to present uh, Saula Tibayeva, who is also my very good friend, actually. <laughs> uh, she's a doctor of philology, Professor Narcosi University, myth critic, literary scholar, national expert, author of more than 140 works, uh, including 12 books, member of the International Association of Myth Criticism and Mysteria. Research interests are myth poetics, cultural code, and narratives. Today, Saule will um, honor us with her uh, paper entitled Step Gnosis, a Modern Myth contradictory reconstruction of meanings. Thank you, Saule, please. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone, dear colleagues. I am very glad uh, to take part for the third time in the traditional and uh, significant conference for Miss Critics and Humanities in, jo in, jo uh, in general, organized by the Asteria Association, uh, the Complutense University, um, separate uh, separate thanks uh, for Adrian is a support and um, Mela and other many many others. 
uh, and I would like to wish everyone a successful and interesting uh, conference. My report is devoted uh, to an interesting problem of traditional step knowledge, including uh, Turkic myth and its reflection in the modern literature of Kazakhstan and uh, uh, neighboring and countries of Central Asia, as well as uh, Siberia, Mongolia, etc. Uh, in these countries, uh, the step noses uh, will spread uh, and develop um, and develop myth, rituals, folklore, folklore, heroic and romantic dustans, um, historical stories, and much more. Noses is an important stem of nomadic, uh, directly connected with the code. Of peoples. Uh, genealogical uh, cosmogony has a special place in the topic step knowledge. In the ancient corpus of and cultural traditions, Tengrism, shamanism, etc. The concept of step gnosis is one of the basic uh, implicitly ex existing concept uh, of Kazakh philosophy, mythology, folklore, literature, ethnopedagogy, ethnopsychology, visual, monumental, musical um, arts, and other humanitarian discourses. By step gnosis, we understand not just a set of certain uh, specific ethnomarked uh, content elements, elements of a particular narratives, but also in a broadest a voluminous uh, mental metacognitive paradigm uh, that includes uh, all of the of the above main discourse. Uh, step notice includes uh, a lot of uh, discursive elements, cultural codes of I'm sorry. And I'm not sure if you, if you can hear us, Saule, but you, you froze and we can't hear you anymore. Maybe you can, uh, I'm not sure, maybe you can try without the video. So, so we can listen to you at, at least. Okay, so, yeah, so, 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 so. I'm I'm so I'm so sorry because my internet joining is not very good. It's not very good and um, uh, interrupted interrupted sometimes uh, sometimes. Yeah, I, um, I, so, I was saying I was saying uh, only that maybe you can you can try uh, without the video. Maybe uh -huh. it will go smoother. We, we, we will listen to you, we will not see you, but uh -huh. okay. Okay, I um, I stop my video, but I continue my <laughs> my audio uh, report. Uh, the step civilization of nomads uh, here we mean the people we mean uh, the peoples of Central Asia, Siberia, and etc. and other peoples is one of the most interesting interdisciplinary issues that reveal great relevance and prospects prospects in the scientific sense. Historical and archaeological discoveries known to world science, uh, the famous uh, Begazid and Dubai culture, uh, the ancient cities of Turkestan, Tara, Signak, Farab, uh, the uh, birthplace of the great Abu Nasr al-Farabi, uh, the Arkaim settlement southern Urals, Russia, and many others, 
show the presence of extensive uh, developed uh, nomadic and settled agricultural uh, civilization on the territory of Kazakhstan and neighboring countries. Without uh, delving into the historical and the archaeological side of the of the study, here we consider the episteme uh, steep uh, notice in the aspect of the reflection in modern literature of Kazakhstan. Uh, because I have no many time uh, and uh, not good connection, uh, internet connection, I uh, pass, I, I will pass uh, to uh, to uh, literature, literature creations. Uh, the conductive, uh, the conducted comprehensive analysis shows that uh, the concept of uh, uh, step uh, noses is realized in Kazakh prose at several interrelated levels of perception, reading, and understanding of the text: spatio-temporal, object think. Uh, symbolic, metaphorical, semiotic, associative, uh, reflexive, proper, proper mental, informative, communicative, and other. For example, in the history Dilo uh, Dilegis Saki by Bulajan Darbekov, the steep is presented as a single place with uh, its ancient inhabitants, the Proto Turks, their beliefs, culture, psychology. Here uh, we see a different artistic approaches. Uh, the inclusion of uh, concise and capacious description of the endless step, step expanses and uh, unique economic, state, political, and legal systems is combined with a dynamic narrative about key events in the ancient history of the, of the Proto Turks. Uh, the associative field of the novel covers uh, the system of the well known historical events and the personalities at the external plot compositional level. At the internal la latent level, traditional binary positions are recreated and developed. developed. War, peace, freedom, slavery, strength, weakness, valor, uh, cowardice, nobility, meanness, uh, step military nomadic society, uh, slave owning uh, society of the ancient East Persia, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, and other. This approach uh, allows creating in the reader's perception a holistic and voluminous, in the cognitive sense, collective, emotional, rich image of the people of the great step. A monolithic warrior people with a rich storytelling tradition capable of resisting any enemy, riding at the same time sacred, sacredly honoring the tradition of their um, ancestors, being hospitable and fearless, wise and uh, naive, sincere and merciless. And uh, I, I want to stay, I want to uh, stay uh, also on uh, on the uh, one novel else um, titled titled the uh, Kazakh erotic novel by Beric uh, Jokibai. Speaking about the controversial reconstruction of the steep noses, including the myth itself, folklore, one cannot ignore the postmodern Kazakh erotic novel uh, by Beric Zhukibai. The genre extension included in the heading uh, has a clearly articulated ethnocultural component, Kazakh. But on the other hand, he refers uh, to the global cultural tradition of erotic literature, starting with the Cameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, and perhaps from earlier sources, for example, from myth about gods and origin, origin uh, genus. It can be said that the work by uh, Jovki Baev de uh, deliberately destroys the canon of the erotic novel genre and erotic literature in general with its emphasis uh, on the semantics of the definition erotic. Uh, 
Such a distri uh, distraction of the authentic content and logic of narration of, uh, of an erotic novel in principle corresponds uh, to the general stylistic orientation of, of a postmodern text aimed uh, at the well-known principle of multiple interpretation. At the same time, the studied novel uh, demonstrates a peculiar philosophical and authentic eclecticism. Uh, the complex structure and style of this novel is not always consistent, but nevertheless formed, formed uh, by uh, the inclusion of various metadata, poetic intertext, mythical proto-Turkish uh, references to various sources, uh, sources on the history and the culture of Kazakh people in general, token, token genesis. Actually, the erotic component is uh, muffled by really interesting passages from Kazakh mythology and the epic you know, way into the cultural genesis of, of the feminine principle, the institution of family and clan in the nomadic tradition. Here, the ritualistics of the steep of the step with animal sacrifices, long ri rituals, magic spells, boxy chants, folklore erotic motifs in the novel are transformed into quasi uh, rit ritualistic of the Soviet and post Soviet times with long ceremonial uh, speeches of various cartoon bosses. One can also note, uh, note a certain uh, hidden metamorphosis of the traditional female principle in, in the proto-Turk and national picture of the world. The foremother Umay, the mystical image of Halas, into the modern female code, in which the mystical and magical elements of the myth base, base are completely destroyed. At the, same at the same time, it must be said that the artistic elaboration of the other historical and cultural codes, the myth of the blue wolf, the pro, uh, genitor, progenitor of the Turks, traditional rituals and habits, folklore sources, as well as uh, the inclusion of lengthy authori authorial ironic exercises, which together with the quasi-detective storyline create a text uh, gravitating uh, towards paraliteration. Such a text um, develops in, at the intersection of literature and philosophy, literature and aesthetics, literature and art criticism, criticism, literature and theology, literature and mythology. The texts uh, cited here are attractive for the experimental side. In addition to, the, uh, to other Intriguing, um, intriguing moments of philosophical research. The following questions also become one of the problems of the poetics of the text. What does the deliberate destruction of the mystical consciousness lead to in, uh, to in a modern text? Whether there is a root destruction of the novel as a mainstream genre or a global value reset of the philosophy and aesthetic of this genre in, is uh, unfolding before us. In conclusion, we know that, uh, that the content and directions of the step notice um, in the context of its artistic uh, reconstruction in modern literature and art of Kazakhstan is one of the most relevant, relevant in, and interesting. Last uh, but not least, uh, this is connected with the issues of pres preserving and developing of the, the national and the cultural identity of the Turkic peoples, substantiating uh, their sovereign equal existence for many millennia. The very existence of step gnosis is a confirmation of the well-known thesis of the dialogue of cultures and uh, civiliza uh, civilizations, uh, cultural diversity on a global scale. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> my my speed is very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And actually, I wanted to give you more time, but you took less. So there's a lot of time for the questions. And this time I will be the icebreaker. This time for once I will be the icebreaker. Um, okay. I wanted to ask you two things, please. First thing is this um, um, Kazakh writer whose name I cannot recall very well. Is he translating European languages? The, the one you compared to, to Boccaccio, is this writer uh, compared in, uh, translated in European languages, English, Italian, Spanish? Is there a translation into European languages? Can you hear me, Saula? 
Could you please? Uh, uh, Saul, please, uh, could you uh, please repeat uh, your question? Because I yeah, yeah, don't it? hear uh, uh, good. No problem. Or, or, or uh, chat. Yeah, basically. Okay. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? OK. Yes. Yes, I want to ask you a couple of questions. So the first question is, this Kazakh karate you were quoting in your paper, is it translated in European languages, English, French, Italian, any European language? No, no, um, uh, uh, in my regret, uh, many Kazakh, uh, many modern Kazakh writers, um, especially um, working in, in a postmodern, uh, postmodernist uh, direction, is not translated um, uh, in other uh, European and uh, world uh, languages. But the process uh, of translation is very complicated, uh, you know, and uh, I think uh, in future uh, this uh, process is, uh, is uh, will be uh, will be speeded, will be arise. Yes. Thank you. I also mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. and then somebody else will ask questions as well. We have plenty of time. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what does the wolf symbolize in Kazakh literature mythology? Is the progenitor of the Kazakhs? So what does that entail? What does that mean? Who is the wolf in Kazakh mythology? Mm -hmm. uh, Can you hear um, me? Uh, yeah. Yes, I, yes, I, uh, I understand your question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Saul. Um, uh, wolf, uh, the image of wolf is uh, is very important uh, image uh, in the Turkic, uh, in general um, uh, Turkic mythology because uh, uh, it uh, it is uh, uh, one of the basic uh, uh, proto uh, protogenesic protogenesic. Uh, Protogenist, yeah? protogenetic images, um, mm -hmm. the ancestor, ancestor of the Turk peoples, of many Turk peoples, Kazakh, Turkish, uh, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyz, uh, Tuva, and others. Um, uh, especially saying uh, the wolf uh, has a blue color, a blue uh, wolf. Uh, so it's a very, very uh, in shape. Um, uh, one is um, many in shape myths, legends, uh, attractive, um, reflecting in in the modern art, in the modern literature. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, this, uh, this image is very stable. Is one of the stable and. Uh, uh, frequent uh, using uh, concepts or in the in the many many humanitarian discourses uh, in Kazakhstan and other neighboring countries. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my fellow icebreaker, perhaps a question from Adrian. I'm not sure, or anybody else. Well, I I, I can't I can't speak something, but <laughs> I I don't really know anything at all. I think th this is an, an interdisciplinary table. I mean, I, I was going to say an, an international table, but also an interdisciplinary one, because we're talking about a lot of different things. So uh, Yes, very different. So yeah, I, I don't really know what else to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I saved you this time. This time yes. was my role to ask questions. <laughs> But I'm sure somebody has yeah. questions. I'm sure somebody has uh, somebody else has questions. Because me, uh, this uh, this problem of uh, step notice, um, yeah, the step notice is, um, in general speaking, is uh, emblem in the emblem and basis of ideology of politics uh, uh, of uh, cultural uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, culture history and uh, mindset of uh, of many many Turk, uh, Turkic uh, peoples uh, because um, it's not uh, only uh, oral tradition uh, and uh, many written uh, written um, uh, written uh, examples of this uh, tradition. I, um, 
I say uh, I I I would uh, I want to tell about uh, these images, but um, our time is not very good. <laughs> it's not very long, and uh, in my report uh, I will uh, continue the uh, research. Thank you very much, Saul. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so you. I'm still hoping for some questions. Who who dares? Who should pay with the gold? Who has questions here? <laughs> I would like to say uh, thank you to Saul for yeah. such an interesting uh, paper. Uh, I agree with Adrian. I, I I I I think that we are. Uh, dealing here with very different issues, but in a way they are all uh, connected with different meanings of, of mythology in different contexts, and I think that's very interesting. And I wanted to ask you something, because I think I understood that for you, myth was very much related to folklore and storytelling, and I was wondering, because this is also very important in Ireland, they established the relationship between uh, their myths, especially their Celtic myths, and the oral tradition and storytelling. And I was wondering if in the context that you were mentioning, the, the, there, there is also this uh, relationship, and in this, if, if the relationship exists, is it related also to an aim of uh, reclaiming a culture of their own, maybe. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Mar Gonzalez, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, it's very important and uh, really uh, actual uh, relevant issues uh, uh, because um, they stop. Uh? Uh -huh. Да, окей. Okay. Yes, of course. Uh, the, uh, the, myth, uh, uh, the myth and folklore are the part, uh, parts of the uh, general step notice. And folklore and um, as a as a более uh, позднее, uh, as a более uh, more, more late more late construction in mm -hmm. the uh, tradition of uh, um, conventionally metaphorical uh, tradition of uh, of the um, uh, of our people and i mean uh, i think uh, and other peoples because myth um, is a uh, первичная <laughs> is the first is the first uh, level uh, before a folklore mm -hmm. of course Okay. Primordial, primordial structure. Of All right. Um, uh, there, are, there are many, many um, uh, traditional um, rituals in Kazakh tradition uh, correlating with uh, uh, the myth and later with folklore. Folklore uh, has a has more didactic meaning, more mm -hmm. didactic. And the myth uh, has a more um, aesthetic, aesthetic uh, art meaning and a more global meaning. Yes. Uh, of course, you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you. Your interest, uh, to, uh, uh, this interesting to topic um, uh, civil, uh, civilization, uh, including uh, myth, uh, mythology, folklore, uh, philosophy is so very um, great, a great deal. Uh, in my opinion, because uh, the topic civilization and uh, steps uh, step civilization is not is not, uh, um, uh, reveal, is not reveal is not reveal in uh, in the European science uh, with uh, its uh, Eurocentric <laughs> centric uh, <laughs> component. Yes, in my opinion. And my uh, my uh, mission, mission. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, in my mission to introduce the European scientists, uh, uh, European uh, critics, uh, myth critics, uh, very great scientists uh, with very vast, very vast space of uh, Asian countries, and. Uh, <laughs> All right. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saule. Thank you very much, Saule. Any more questions? Okay. I think it's time for one more question. Yeah, that, I, I think that, that was an interesting point that, well, it's, it's the, the barrier of language after all that, um, for example, in this conference, we are dealing with a myth theory that is um, inherently uh, based on Europe. So mm -hmm. we are missing a lot of, for example, uh, the, the myths from Kazakhstan, we are missing them because we don't know them because we can't really read them. <laughs> so it's not <laughs> the first thing because the, the barrier of language is a very big one. And if we add some other thing, like for example, the, the prevalence of mm -hmm. oral myths, that's, there is a, a lot of lost knowledge, for example, like the, I, I I also understood that there was some effort to to preserve this this knowledge. So yeah. if re relating it to to what Saul Andretti said before, uh, I think it would be good to promote translations, but maybe yeah. it's difficult. I don't know. I think I think that's also Eurocentric in a way because we're asking. Hey, yes. that you, you please translate so we so that I can understand so, you. Yes. Yes, but we should imagine. all learn Kazakh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. I, 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 I agree with you, Adrian, completely, because uh, it's very, very great problem um, um, correlated with uh, with um, adequate uh, transmission transmission of many, many uh, interesting creatures of our uh, artists. Yes. Thank you very much for, you much. Um, for your attention, for your interest in, uh, to, this, uh, to this issue. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll just wrap it up very fast. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, I just use the first names, it's easier that way, uh, Rami, Mare del Mar, Paola and Saule for the wonderful session. And thank you, Adrian, for your help. Without you, we wouldn't have made it. And uh, I would say I was mm -hmm. delighted to uh, chair this session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Saul. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to Saul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh -huh. Goodbye. Uh, Bye. Thank you. Saul, Saul, See you. Um, <laughs> Please. Thank you. Uh, I uh, I would like uh, I would like to thank you very much your presentation your uh, leading our session. Um, um, uh, I so appreciate your um, contribution to this uh, uh, to this uh, conference. Thank you, Rachmet. Thank you. I say that in your language to prove that I'm not Eurocentric. Rachmet. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye